Welcome back. In this session, we will be discussing the chemistry and medicinal aspect of neurotransmitters. Okay. Now, neurotransmitters are chemicals, small chemicals that are generated from the neurons and then they bind, they have a receptor site very close by uh, in the next adjacent neuron or muscle, neuron or muscle cell and then bind there and then send a signal. Okay. Signal and then that creates a cascade of reactions. So, they are called neurotransmitters. So, neurotransmitters are small are small molecules, uh, they are uh, they are also belong to a class of what are called chemical messengers. Chemical neurotransmitters are chemical messengers which are secreted by neuronal cells and then they have a nearby binding pocket in adjacent neuro neuronal cells or muscles, muscular cells okay. and then produce some signal which then carries out a cascade of reaction and exerts the effect, the desired effect. Okay. Now, chemical messengers are basically two types, one is neurotransmitter, another is hormone. So, neurotransmitter already I gave you the definition, the hormones are usually uh, secreted by from the glands and then like pituitary gland, gland or adrenal glands and they actually traverse through the blood stream to different, uh, to different sites and then, uh, and then exert the effect by binding to their receptor. Okay. So, the difference between chemical messenger and hormonal is there uh, where are they produced number one and number two is that neurotransmitters are basically they do not traverse long distance, they bind to a nearby site whereas, hormones are distributed to different parts of the body. So, today we are going to talk about a neurotransmitter which is called acetylcholine, okay, which is called acetylcholine. Now, the structure of acetylcholine is given here very simple, it is an ester and then it is basically an ethanol amine but the amine is is represented is present as a quaternary salt there are three methyl groups here okay three methyl groups so it's a ethanol amine derivative and the eth the alcohol is uh, esterified by the acetyl group so that is called hence the name acetylcholine so you can say what is choline choline will be which and then in this 3 methyls and plus this is what is only choline. Okay. Now, this what is the function of this acetylcholine okay. that is number 1. So, the questions that are that what is the function number 2 is that where does it bind means where does it bind? It has got a definitely a receptor and a binding pocket, but exactly uh, exactly what is the characteristics of that binding pocket. Number 3 is how is the concentration of acetylcholine maintained. Okay. So, these are the few questions and then what are the medical consequences, because now we are we are uh, going to uh, going to the topic where we will pick out different um, molecules and then they are uh, their chemistry or biochemistry and then accordingly we will try to design drugs. The molecules that we will be talking about either they are shortfall or they are excessive secretion will, uh, will cause some harmful effects. So, you need medicine to treat that. 
So, these are basically first of all we have to see the chemistry of this acetylcholine and accordingly we will then decide what are the molecules that can modulate the function of uh, function of this neurotransmitter. Okay. So, what are the medical consequences that is the fourth question. Now, acetylcholine as I said all neurotransmitters are secreted by the neurons. Okay. Now, acetylcholine has um, has receptors which should be nearby that means, a, a nearby nearby neuron or it could be a, a muscular cell. Okay. Now, suppose if it is a this is suppose your neuron. Okay. So, acetylcholine is secreted from here uh, and that secretion is dictated by uh, by what is called an action potential. Okay. When to fire or when to generate acetylcholine that depends on this action potential and then you have adjacent neuron suppose and it has got a binding pocket here. So, acetylcholine this is called the post synaptic cleft post synaptic synap post synaptic uh, cleft. Okay. So, acetylcholine drops into this into this area and then it goes and binds to this active site pocket and that creates a signal. So, what type of signal that also we will uh, highlight a little bit. What has been found that acetylcholine has two types of receptor sites. Now, these receptor sites are named according to the the neurotransmitter or according to the hormone like estrogen is a hormone. So, where it binds it will be called an estrogen receptor. Similarly, the, the receptors where the where acetylcholine binds is called cholinergic receptors cholinergic receptors. Now, these cholinergic receptors again are two types in one type what happens that there are some natural compounds like this is what is called muscarine. This natural product muscarine uh, if it is taken then uh, this muscarine goes and binds to particular type of receptors which are meant for acetylcholine. Okay. So, they are called muscarine receptors they are called muscarine receptors, but they actually belong to the cholinergic receptors. So, cholinergic receptors are those where acetylcholine binds, but they are subdivided into two one is called muscarine receptors that means, one is distinguished by the fact that only those receptor sites can be occupied by muscarine and the other is the site which is called nicotinic receptors. nicotinic receptors and nicotinic uh, uh, nicotine is shown here this is nicotine and that is muscarine. So, nicotine will not bind to the muscarine receptors or muscarine will not bind to the nicotine receptors nicotinic receptors, okay. but both belong to the cholinergic uh, receptor systems. Now, what is the signal that we are talking about what it does actually when acetylcholine binds. Uh, what is the what it does huh? there are two kinds of receptor already we know. Now, in one kind it is the nicotinic uh, receptor what happens that in the cell membrane the cell membrane you know the cell membrane is basically a lipid bilayer where the hydrophobic part are pointing towards towards each other and that actually constitutes the membrane that means, the inner part of the membrane is very hydrophobic and then these are the these are the head groups. So, one is pointing towards the uh, towards the outside and another is pointing towards the towards the cytosol suppose this is the cell. So, these will be pointed towards cytosol 
and these head groups are pointed outwards. Now, in these membranes what has been found that membranes there are many proteins which are embedded in the membrane and these proteins are called membrane bound proteins and these membrane bound proteins have an exterior surface which is interacting with see this is your cell which is interacting with external molecules and it has also some internal part interior part which is pointing towards the cytosol. Okay. So, now the question is what is the purpose of these different membrane proteins? They have different functions, but one type of function of the membrane proteins is that they allow foreign molecules to enter through them enter through them by forming channels okay by forming channels that means if this is your this is the suppose the membrane and suppose this is the membrane protein okay now what it does that it can allow it can provide a a channel or a pore through which foreign molecules or ions can enter into the cell or can go out of the cell. Okay. Now, and these pores are sometimes they are closed, sometimes they are open. When it is required that some ions need to be need to enter or get out of the cell, then it bec it opens up uh, and that opening and closing. So, basically this is acting as a log gate and the opening and the closing can be can be dictated by several ways. One is called mechanically gated, mechanical means you apply some pressure from outside and that will open the open the gate like this membrane protein this is the channel. So, the channel is open when you apply pressure if you release the pressure then the top portion join with each other and close the close that pore. Okay. So, this is called mechanically gated that means the gate is open only when there is a pressure from outside mechanical pressure. Then there are different types um, voltage gated that means the electrical potential controls the opening and the closing process, but the one that we are interested in here is what is called ligand gated ligand gated ion channel. Okay. These nicotinic receptors are basically ligand, they activate the ligand or they act as the ligand gated ion channel opening. How? Because this may be the next slide will have that uh, let us uh, now this is the, the different one. Uh, no, I think this is I can explain it. Here it is written nicotin, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors are ligand gated ion channels permeable to sodium, potassium and calcium ions. So, that means they allow the inflow or outflow of these ions. Okay. In other words they are ion channels embedded in cell membranes capable of switching from a closed to an open state when acetylcholine binds to them. In the open state they allow ions to pass through. So, what we are saying that suppose this is the your that membrane protein okay. membrane protein there may be different uh, it, it is a multimeric protein it is a multimeric protein. So, inside there is a there is a channel now the channel is something like this. So, that means this is basically very narrow means this is closed suppose. Now, it has this membrane protein has a binding site has a receptor site where acetylcholine binds. So, when acetylcholine binds this channel becomes the membrane protein will be like this sorry like this. So, now it becomes sorry. So, earlier it was going inwards and locking the passage blocking the gate 
now it becomes open and now the ions can freely move into the cell or outside the cell. But this will happen as long as acetylcholine is bound to the receptor site. So, as soon as the acetylcholine is detached from here, this goes into the resting state that means the closed state. Okay. So, this opening is by I can say A C H E that is what acetylcholine you can abbreviate as A C H E acetylcholine uh, acetylcholine not E sorry only acetylcholine. Um, so, the what we have learned that there is this when you talk about the nicotinic receptors here the nicotinic receptors are what they are ion channel they are ligand gated ion channels. Okay. Ligand gated ligand means here ligand is acetylcholine. So, it sits on the membrane protein which are ion channels ion channel proteins and then it opens up the channel and the ions uh, pass through it what ions sodium potassium or calcium and then when it is detached then it goes to again the state where the gate is locked. Okay. So, basically it controls the passage of sodium potassium or calcium. Now, the question is who controls what really controls this see basically now you have um, remember there must be a neuron here which drops in the acetylcholine into the post into the synaptic uh, cleft and then uh, that goes here. So, there is an equilibrium between A C H plus this receptor. So, that will have an equilibrium process A C H receptor that is the bound state. So, in the bound state you have the open open gate okay, open gate and here you have the receptor closed here. Okay. So, there is this equilibrium going on. Now, if you want to see you do not want the signal to be uh, to be produced for a long time because that is also not good it has to be maintained properly that when it is required acetylcholine goes drops from the neuronal cell in the synaptic cleft and then uh, binds to the uh, to its receptor and opening the gate. But this uh, because there is an equilibrium, but you want this signal to be to be produced for a certain length of time and then it should be stopped uh, you do not want all the time. So, what will happen how to stop that you have an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase that is what is A C H E acetylcholine esterase. This acetylcholine esterase what it does that remember acetylcholine has a structure O C O C H 3 and then N M E 3 plus. So, acetylcholine brings it back to the choline brings it back to choline. Okay. So, again just uh, repeat the whole thing acetylcholine sits on to the uh, nicotinic if it is nicotinic receptor then it sits onto the nicotine receptor and then opens up the gate this is called ligand gated ion channel and then the ions move in or out. Okay. And then how to stop this signal because if uh, then you have to either hydrolyze if you hydrolyze this uh, the acetylcholine by this enzyme acetylcholine esterase then the equilibrium will be shifted on this side. Okay. So, you will have open you will have the resting state of the receptor that means the closed where the the gate is closed and the that means the flow of ions will also stop. Okay. So, this is for the nicotine receptor we will come back to this acetylcholine esterase uh, once we are through with the muscarinic receptor. The muscarinic receptor is is little bit different here this is the membrane protein and in the membrane protein remember the receptor site is in the membrane protein. So, also the uh, so also the that channel ion channel the channel is also maintained by the by the by the membrane protein. 
there is another type of uh, receptor which is the muscarinic receptor what it does it has got this different uh, different uh, monomers of the protein so it's a complex it's a multimeric system and then what happens when the ligand in this case again acetylcholine if it sits if it is released and sits onto its binding pocket this is remember this is your muscarinic muscarinic binding pocket uh, muscarinic receptor muscarinic receptor okay so when it binds what happens here this is what is called gpcr g protein coupled receptor g protein coupled receptor this is a different kind of receptor it activates the g proteins now what is so earlier when the ligand means acetylcholine sits onto the nicotinic receptor site then the the it is a ligand gated ion channel in the muscarinic site it sits onto the membrane protein which is a g protein coupled receptor that means when it sits onto the receptor there is a system called g protein which will be activated now what is this g protein the g protein is like this that if you have this is your membrane you have this suppose the g protein coupled receptor so there is a receptor site your acetylcholine sits here what is g protein g protein is something uh, it's a trimer of alpha beta and gamma these three subunits that was um, that is present as a trimer so it's a heterotrimeric uh, trimeric protein which is also membrane which is which is moving into in the in the membrane okay going from here to there now one part is one is called alpha unit another is called beta unit another is called gamma unit and in the alpha unit something is attached which is called gdp that means guanosine diphosphate okay so when this acetylcholine receptor binds onto this muscarinic receptor uh, acetylcholine binds to the muscarinic receptor there is a binding pocket here where the this g protein why this is called g protein because it is attached to gdp which uh, which one is attached it is the alpha subunit attached to gdp now what happens as soon as this binds acetylcholine this goes and alpha binds to the to this other active site pocket which is intracellular and and after binding see what happens here it is we are showing from here so the ligand is bound to the receptor the alpha subunit is bound to the to the inner side interior of the of this membrane and this is the g protein and now what happens as soon as it bounds there is a reaction where gdp is now replaced by gtp so earlier it was gdp now gdp comes off falls off as it binds and then gtp goes and binds to the alpha subunit but that has got some uh, that actually dissociates the whole thing from the from this membrane dissociates uh, the alpha falls off along with gtp and the protein the now this protein which was earlier uh, consisting of alpha beta gamma now the beta gamma unit stays intact but the alpha is now attached to G gtp and then uh, there is a reaction when the alpha subunit um, it creates a, it does a reaction in which you have let me see no it is not there it is no it is not here let just i will uh, write the reaction that alpha gtp uh, then activates another protein which is called adi adenylyl cyclase adenylyl cyclase adenylyl cyclase is uh, basically it if you take atp that atp is converted into 
C A M P. I will write what is that C A M P. So, so basically again I repeat because this is a little bit complicated. So, first you have this alpha beta gamma the G protein floating into the in the membrane traversing in, in the membrane and you have this muscarinic receptor ok. Acetylcholine comes and binds to the to its receptor pocket and what it does it opens up another pocket in the same membrane protein, but when it opens up this alpha subunit binds to this open port ok. And as soon as it binds the GDP falls off and it is replaced by GTP and then as a result the whole thing dissociates from here and then the and also this acetylcholine also goes up. So, that closes this pocket and so every this whole thing dissociates off, but they dissociate off in such a way that the beta gamma unit remains intact and the alpha is separate it is attached to the GTP. Now, this goes and activates an enzyme called adenylyl cyclase. Now, what is the reaction that it catalyzes? It catalyzes uh, this is adenine, it catalyzes this reaction phosphate, phosphate, phosphate. So, it catalyzes. So, you have So, this is what is cyclic AMP, CAMP means cyclic AMP. Now, this is called a second messenger, second messenger, second messenger and it carries out the signal and then like activation of adenylyl cyclase. So, you get CAMP and then that ultimately creates a lot of uh, biochemical reactions which is responsible for cell growth and motility. There are other other uh, parts are here, but we are only talking about uh, this activation of adenylyl cyclase. So, again basically I repeat that first it is the membrane protein, the acetylcholine sits, activates it, the G protein binds, the alpha subunit binds, the GTP falls off and then it is bound to GTP, then the whole thing dissociates and then. Um, the alpha subunit remain uh, alpha subunit remain alone along with the uh, attached to GTP and that goes and activates adenylyl cyclase. So, that you get this reaction you get CAMP, CAMP is a sec called a second messenger because this is not the primary one the primary one is the acetylcholine because of the acetylcholine you are releasing CAMP and this CAMP now goes and uh, takes out the signal and controls the uh, or creates a cascade of processes like activation of PKA and which ultimately results uh, in cell growth and motility that means, the survival of the cell ok. So, this is the two, uh, two receptors muscarinic receptors is a G protein is a GPCR and the other is nicotinic acetylcholine receptors and that is ion channel ligand gated ion channels. Now, the next question is how to control or who controls the concentration of acetylcholine because that is very important because that will decide how long this uh, this signal will percolate ok. So, I told you about one enzyme that is called acetylcholine esterase which hydrolyzes the acetylcholine and uh, disturbs the equilibrium to the left side that means, the uh, the open the resting state of the membrane re, uh, membrane protein ok. So, this enzyme is very important acetylcholine esterase. Now, suppose in uh, suppose in the in some cases that the acetylcholine uh, is hydrolyzed hydrolyzed more rapidly than is expected. That means, you have more concentration of acetylcholine esterase and that is hydrolyzing the acetylcholine uh, much before the expected contact time of the acetylcholine with its receptor, then what will happen? You have a problem with the signal processing, the signal transduction, 
the amount of signal that will be generated. So, there you uh, talk about the, uh, the disease conditions that means, the acetylcholine has to be properly uh, balanced the concentration. So, that the optimum level of signal transduction takes place. If the acetylcholine esterase is overactive, uh, then what will happen? You will have less concentration of acetylcholine because you are hydrolyzing that and that means, you have less amount of signal that will be generated out of this binding to the receptor. So, this is a very important enzyme and as a consequence, if you stop acetyl, if you um, there are two ways of doing this, other is if the acetylcholine esterase, if you uh, if you suppose inhibit the acetylcholine esterase completely shut off the acetylcholine esterase activity, then what will happen? That will also a catastrophic because you will have the acetylcholine will be bound to the receptor for a long and um, for a for a greater length of time and that also causes lot of neuronal diseases. Okay. So, we will talk about that, but before that a quick look at uh, the mechanism of hydrolysis, the mechanism of acetylcholine esterase. Now, we know that uh, it is a serine it is a serine esterase, serine based esterase. We have we have uh, read in the first part of this uh, of this course that how serine proteases work. It is very similar serine esterases work by you have this uh, histidine uh, base and then histidine activates the serine and the serine goes and uh, hydrolyze attacks the carbonyl and resulting in uh, hydrolysis of the forming first of all for forming the tetrahedral intermediate and then later on hydrolyzed by water okay. and that is the mechanism of acetylcholine. It is very similar to what we have read earlier. Now, see the diseases that are associated with, uh, with this uh, disbalance of the acetylcholine, one is called myasthenia gravis. It is an autoimmune disease which results from antibodies that block or destroy nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. So, if you destroy the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors at the junction between the nerve and the, and the muscle. Okay. The muscle cells at the junction uh, where you have this nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. So, that basically controls the muscle contraction uh, processes, contraction and expansion processes. Uh, then, what will happen that if you it is an autoimmune disease which destroys the receptors. So, if you destroy the receptor, that means you are no longer having the ligand gated ion channels, and so your, your muscle contraction will not take place. Okay. Uh, this prevents nerve impulses from triggering muscle con con contractions. Okay. So, that results in uh, this type of eye, eye leads, eye leads is covering most of the uh, covering most of the eye which is exposed uh, to which is exposed uh, to outside that means, through which we see that portion is very is tiny in size. So, most of the time it is almost very uh, almost in closed condition. Okay. So, that is called myasthenic gravis that means, there is a problem of uh, opening it that means, because to open and close you have to have a muscular contraction and expansion. Okay. So, that is controlled by this nicotinic uh, receptors means, nicotinic receptors which are part of the cholinergic report, uh, receptors. So, this is one disease uh, which is acetylcholine uh, which is dependent on this acetylcholine receptors. Now, myasthenia gravis is generally treated with medications known as acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. So, now you can take there are drugs uh, which can treat this uh, and that is uh, these are inhibitors of acetylcholine esterase. Because, whatever small amount of uh, receptor sites are still available, if 100 percent are destroyed then you get complete shut of the eye, but if some receptors are still there and some receptors are uh, destroyed by this autoimmune response. So, what you want that acetylcholine uh, 
uh, should be there as much as possible. So, that most of the receptors can interact with the acetylcholine. So, that means, you have to uh, inhibit the acetylcholine esterase. Okay. So, that the acetylcholine concentration is more there. Okay. Now, acetylcholine esterases as anticholine esterases. Okay. Basically, they are inhibitors of acetylcholine esterase. The enzyme that hydrolyzes acetylcholine, if acetylcholine is not hydrolyzed, is not destroyed, it can return to active to reactivate the cholinergic receptor and increase cholinergic effects. Okay. Therefore, an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor will have some same biological effect as a cholinergic agonist. Means, if you like muscarine, suppose you are not producing acetylcholine okay, in the body. So, what you can do? You can take muscarine and now muscarine because it binds to that uh, muscarine is G protein sorry muscarine is G protein couple receptors and if there is a problem with that you can take muscarine and that will activate your uh, the receptor side GPCR and if you have problem with this con muscle con uh, this contraction then what you can do you can take nicotine also because nicotine will also be a uh, will act as a receptor and produce the same kind of signals. So, that means they are agonist what are agonist I will tell again agonists are basically go to the receptor and then produces the same type of effect like the natural ligand. In this case the natural ligand is acetylcholine. Okay. The nerve gases diisopropyl fluorophosphate and sarine these are very dangerous compounds huh, were discovered and, and uh, perfected long before their mode of action was known. Basically what happened? that you produce something and then you see that it has got some biological effect, but you do not know why it is uh, producing the biological effect. So, basically these were first made and then showed that they have very uh, disastrous effect uh, on the on living systems, but the mechanism was not known, but later on the mechanism was, uh, was discovered and basically what have been found that both agents inhibit acetylcholine esterase irreversibly phosphorylating the serine residue at the active site. So, if you look at these structures diisopropyl fluorophosphate and serine, serine is again a fluorophosphonate because it is a carbon now fluorophosphonate with the isopropyl uh, group here. So, what happens that you have this basically it is serine and then you have a base which is imidazole. The mechanism is that the base abstracts the hydrogen the serine attacks the carbonyl carbonyl group of the ester and subsequently the ester gets hydrolyzed that is the mechanism. But instead of acetylcholine what happens now this fluorophosphate goes. So, now this serine is here. So, that attacks the attacks the fluorophosphate and uh, let us see the yes that attacks the fluorophosphate here it is shown serine attacking the fluorophosphate of course, there is a base here that is the imidazole that assists this uh, nucleophilic substitution, but now the fluorine will leave because it is a it is a good living group. So, F minus will leave and you get a stable phosphate. Okay, stable phosphate that will be difficult to hydrolyze. So, basically you are now this is irreversible inhibition of irreversible inhibition of acetylcholine esterase. Okay, so, that is why they, uh, they are showing their, uh, their action actually what happens now you will um, get uh, what will happen if it is uh, if it uh, if you are exposed to this sudden is a gas that is even problematic because gas can be circulated from one place to another very quickly. Okay. So, if uh, if you are exposed to sudden you are going to die within uh, very quickly uh, because of this they are very potent irreversible inhibitor of um, acetylcholine 
esterase. Okay. So, that means huge amount of acetylcholine is, uh, is generated in the synaptic cleft and that is not good because that sends constant signal which ultimately paralyze the, uh, paralyze the living system basically. Uh, now, it is always not bad, serine is very bad if it is used for the destruction of the human being. Okay. But you can also have acetylcholine esterase inhibitors to kill the, the insect, insect or pests uh, by using again the insect, the insects also use acetylcholine, acetylcholine esterase. Uh, they also have acetylcholine esterase in their body acetylcholine is there. So, you can actually develop compounds which are extremely important agrochemicals. Okay. They are they are the ones which are called insecticides because they kill the insects. Okay. What is the mechanism of uh, their action? They are see these are well known compounds malathion, parathion and then uh, chlorpyrifos these are basically all uh, insecticide. So, what will happen here the similar very similar like this uh, nitro derivative paranitrophenol derivative. So, your serine is going to attack here and this goes out and then it stays there which as the phosphate thiophosphate in this case okay, thiophosphate. So, the mechanism is very similar that they uh, they are not hydrolyzed quickly and in the process the pest is killed the insect it gets uh, destroyed. Okay. I think the mechanism. Now, the question is suppose uh, somebody is exposed to this serine gas is there any antidote for it means how to what will be the antidote because serine or this diisopropyl fluorophosphate what happens the serine is now hooked up as the as the phosphate or the phosphonate okay, the fluorine leaves. Now, the question is it is an irreversible inhibition, but can this be again reversed back to the acetylcholine and uh, acetylcholine esterase can be freed from that irreversible uh, irreversible, com, uh, irreversible complex. Now, yes it is possible, but before that I forgot to mention one thing that acetylcholine the structure is this O C O C H 3. Now, what has been found because this is a substrate. So, enzyme is having two sides in one side there must be a negative charge. So, that this N M E 3 can form a weak bond and in the other side you have this active serine. So, active the reactive serine hydrolyzes it and this actually offers the binding pocket for the A me 3 plus. Okay. So, if you want to regenerate again the, uh, the irreversibly that irreversible complex here that you can regenerate the enzyme uh, from the phosphate from the from the serine which is now blocked as a phosphate. How that you make a compound like this a pyridinium based compound where there is a positive charge here that that acts like the trimethyl ammonium salt of the uh, of acetylcholine and this is the the nucleophile now you do not have any ester group here or a phosphate group here instead you have a nucleophile. Now, the whole thing actually uh, the idea came from the fact that if you are exposed to serine. So, you get this type of phosphate if you are exposed to serine then it was found that this enzyme can be freed by using hydroxylamine. So, if hydroxylamine can generate because the this can attack and then free the free the serine moiety. So, but hydroxylamine is will be will be very non specific it is a very small compound it is a it is also it may be quite toxic also, 
because it is it will it is indiscriminately attacked at different places. So, which is not good. Eh? So, what you want is a very specific one hydroxylamine does not possess the the part which goes into the which which uh, participates in the binding process that is the positively charged nitrogen. So, what you do you take an oxim instead of hydroxy uh, hydroxylamine you take an oxim based on a pyridinium moiety. Okay. So, you have the pyridinium moiety which forms the uh, salt bridge here between the uh, the carboxylate which is the anion and then the hydroxylamine is rightly placed uh, into the uh, so that it can attack the phosphate and regenerate the serine. So, if somebody is exposed to serine or any type of nerve gas then the antidote is this one pralidoxim and the mechanism of action is regeneration via nucleophilic attack, but you cannot use any nucleophile like hydroxylamine which also generates you want to have the binding partner also. So, in the form of this uh, methyl pyridinium salt. Okay. So, that uh, this is what is the which is used for myasthenia gravis that I told physostigmine is the one here this is protonated in the in the pH that we have in the biological medium. So, that acts as the creates the salt bridge and uh, this is the uh, this is an inhibitor. So, here it is the serine and then serine attacks and releases releases this part okay. and the serine is blocked as this carbamate. So, that is how the uh, this physostigmine this is a natural product that works against acetylcholine. Okay. So, now what we have that acetylcholine can be this is the mechanism of this physo uh, that physostigmine uh, just here it is written as ER, but is the mechanism is same I said that ultimately you will get a carba carbamate ultimately. Okay. So, that is quite that is stable. So, the acetylcholine uh, you can use it for uh, just to summarize now acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter it has got two types of uh, receptors nicotinic uh, receptors and muscarinic receptors receptors one is your uh, gpcr that is muscarinic another is your ligand gated ion channel and you can uh, there is an enzyme which which maintains the optimum concentration of the acetylcholine and the enzyme is called acetylcholine esterase and if you can inhibit this you can have a different kinds of uh, drugs and depending on the different type of use. If you are using this eye problem myasthenia gravis then you use it in human and uh, that, uh, that actually uh, can, can um, solve some of the uh, problems associated with myasthenia gravis. You can use it also to kill humans very reactive compounds which are called serine or fluorophosphate and if you want to utilize it for the beneficiary for bene, uh, for, uh, for benefit of mankind then what you do you, you actually kill the insects by using it on the agro field and where the insects are killed by inhibition of the inhibition of your acetylcholine esterase in the insect and the last point is that how can you recover if somebody is exposed to serine then what I said that you can use uh, oxim based pyridinium salt which can uh, recover which can release the serine from the uh, which is the blocked as the phosphate and then thereby uh, the person may be saved. Okay. So, that is all for acetylcholine thank you.